Today we'll try and help you make the decision of which army you'd like to play when you play the game of Warhammer 40k. Hello and welcome back to All Specs Tactics, the strategy and tactics focused 40k channel where we're all about getting the most out of our miniatures on the tabletop. So Warhammer 40k has got an ever expanding array of armies and choosing which one to play is quite a major decision when you come into this hobby or for those of us who have already been playing for some years, choosing which army to pick up next. Now everyone will have their own criteria for what they want to get out of playing the game of 40k, whether that's powerful rules, beautiful dynamic looking miniatures that they really like, or if they really enjoy the lore and backgrounds behind a faction, and how they make war in the 40k universe. Price is also another consideration, some armies cost considerably less than others, and some of them will have far fewer miniatures that you need to paint up to get on the table to get a reasonable sized force together. When picking the army, it's worth weighing up the pros and cons of each of these factors before jumping in, getting your first models and getting them painted and on the table. In this video, we'll be taking a look at the various different factions and we'll be assessing all of them from each of these criteria to help people make a more informed decision when they're picking up an army. Before we start though, my overarching advice would generally be to get an army that they like the look and feel of and not just for the rules mechanics because the miniatures will be the actual things that you own, the rules mechanics can change, things go in and out of vogue, particularly in 8th edition with its frequent balance updates. So unless you're really looking to get into the tournament or competitive scene, I'd probably first make your choice on the miniatures that you actually like, before looking at it, which units and rules in that army are best, as this will change from edition to edition and update to update. All of that being said, let's jump in and we'll go through each of the armies one by one. First and foremost, we have Games Workshop's poster boys, the Space Marines. They're the iconic face of the 40k universe, and that certainly has a lot of advantages when you're collecting their army. The Space Marines are genetically engineered superhumans, and each one is often worth several of the, your enemy's soldiers. Trained and equipped with the best that humanity has to offer, the Space Marines truly are the elite of humanity. In terms of actually collecting the faction, they're probably the cheapest single faction to pick up, mainly because their miniatures are so readily available. In the starter kits such as Dark Imperium and No No Fear, which we did a review of recently if you're interested, and they also have a whole bunch of easy to build kits available, and they're the biggest army so often have the most options for buying stuff second hand online. As they're an elite army which you don't need quite as many models as some, this all ties together into them probably being the cheapest army to collect, which is certainly a big positive. The Space Marine range is absolutely enormous, so you'll certainly not be short of sculpts to choose from, though following the start of 8th edition, basically all of the new releases have been the new bigger size Primaris scale marines, which is Games Workshop's way of slowly refreshing the range without making everyone's marines redundant all at once, as has happened in the past with some armies. As Primaris are likely going to be the way forward, I typically advise that those are the units that you might want to focus on collecting more than the standard scale marines, but I do think that the standard scale marines will certainly be around for years and years to come yet, so if you're set on it, I wouldn't let it hold you back. As the range is so huge, there's some very new kits available, and some very old ones, like the very old Dreadnought kit, and various ancient characters. In general though, the newer kits are very nice indeed. There was a lot of positive reaction to the sleek and less blingy look of the Primaris Space Marines when they came out. Rules wise, Space Marines are currently at the absolute pinnacle of the competitive scene and are stomping tournaments all over the place. I'd be amazed if they don't get a little bit of a balanced redress in the coming spring FAQ, but I guess we'll see what happens then. As the biggest faction with the most players, they get the most support, meaning that you'll often get frequent and thought out models and rules updates, more so than any other faction in the game. Because of their enormous range and all of the individual supplement books that Space Marines can choose from, they have the widest range of playstyles in any army of the game. Whether you want a tank army, elite close range shooting units, an old dreadnought army, a bunch of flyers, or an infiltrating special ops type force. Overall, all of these factors really reward players for collecting Space Marines, particularly people who are newer to the hobby. I initially got into the hobby trying to collect Dark Eldar, back when they were quite a skilled army to use, and was not very well supported, and I quickly switched to Space Marines, which with hindsight I can absolutely say was a good decision. Moving on from the poster boys, we'll take a look at the various factions of Space Marines that have their own codex. First of all, we have the Dark Angels. These guys are the monastic and secretive space marines that are sort of a shadowy knightly order in space. They have fast-moving hunter-killer units in the Raven Wing and their elite Terminator formation in the Death Wing. Their unique kits are a little bit more expensive than the standard space marine range, so a little bit pricier, but they still benefit from all the discount opportunities from space marine models, as you can use pretty much any of the models with their range. Their unique models are pretty nice and mostly fairly recent, in particular, things like their Dark Talon and Ravenwing Landspeeders are very nice indeed. 
like the rest of Space Marines, they're quite strong at the moment, just having their update in Psychic Awakening, Vigil of the Damned. They get a reasonable amount of support, but a little bit less than the standard Space Marines, as they're often playing catch-up to the main Space Marine Codex. Their playstyles are a little bit more restricted than Space Marines, mainly about exploiting their unique units, fast-moving bikes, elite Terminators, with the majority of the army being best as a gun line. Next we have the Other Angels of Death, the Blood Angels, a Space Marine chapter that exemplifies the fallen hero archetype, much like their Primarch Sanguinius. Much of their chapter are noble and selfless individuals battling against their genetic flaw, the Red Thirst, which makes them prone to rage and eventual fall into madness. Again, they're reasonably cheap to play if you take advantage of some of the discount options that Space Marines have. Their unique units are a little bit more expensive, but as they're quite points-intensive units, it means that you can fill out an army for quite cheap. They have some nice unique sculpts in the Death Company and the Sanguinary Guard miniatures, and their rules are pretty strong at the moment, though in general they do heavily encourage you into an all-out assault-based playstyle, as basically all their benefits are geared towards that. In general though, this is a pretty fun and dynamic playstyle. Third out of the core Space Marine chapters that have their own codex is the Space Wolves. These are Space Marines from the planet of Fenris, who have a Viking and Nordic theme going on, with a slightly unhealthy fixation on all things to do with wolves. Similar to the other two, they're not so expensive to collect as a faction because they're an elite army, meaning that you don't need quite as many units. Their unique miniatures are well executed on the whole, but do tend to divide opinions a bit on their looks. In particular, a lot of people aren't the biggest fan of their new Wolfram models, but your mileage might vary. Personally, really quite like the Thunder Wolves. Even if Space Marines riding giant wolves, it's a bit of a silly concept. In terms of their rules, they're currently awaiting an update in Saga of the Beasts, so we'll have to see what that brings for them but in reality it's only ever going to make them stronger. The Space Wars are in general a fairly assault-based force, their playstyle being particularly focused on individual hero units, carving out their own saga by single-handedly achieving great feats. Moving on, we have some more unique Space Marines in the Death Watch. The Death Watch are the Imperium's dedicated alien hunters, drawn from a whole variety of different chapters for specific missions, and employing unique technological advancements to deal with their intended foe. Again, as small elite armies, Death Watch armies aren't quite as pricey as some of the other options out there. They're perhaps a bit more so than the standard Space Marines. Unfortunately, they really don't have a lot of unique miniatures in the range at all. The Death Watch are primarily a few HQs, their veterans kit, and an upgrade for some intercessors. Admittedly, their veterans box set is a very high quality multi-part plastic kit with tons of options, but beyond that it's a bit limited. Their core units are strong, with their main gameplay being focused around tooled up strike teams teleporting in to take down enemy targets, perhaps with a bit of fire support from their unique flyer and their dreadnoughts, but other than that they don't have access to the majority of the Space Marine armory, unlike the Blood Angels or Dark Angels for example. As a slightly more minor faction, they don't tend to see quite as much Games Workshop support, particularly new releases are a lot slower to spill over to them. That being said, they are awaiting a Psychic Awakening update that should be out within the next few months, I'm personally hoping that that might bring some Phobos arms units to the Death Watch, but I guess we'll see. Next up we have the Grey Knights, where the Death Watch hunt Xenos. The Grey Knights are the Imperium's dedicated demon hunters, and have an entire ton of special rules that make them stronger against the foul forces of chaos. From the shadowy homeworld of Titan, they use their psychic abilities to predict where demons will come in, showing up to lend their support to Imperial forces in only the direst need. Much like the Death Watch, these guys are the elite of the elite in their own field, each marine being a seasoned veteran and also a psyker. They all carry force weapons and various psychically augmented shooting options to carry into battle. Again, the Grey Knights are a pretty cheap army to collect on the whole. They have some very points expensive Terminators and Dread Knight options, which allows your real world money to turn into a lot of points on the table. Their range is somewhat limited, but a bit less so than the Death Watch. They have a great multi-part strike squad kit that can be turned into multiple unique units, a decent terminator squad kit, and their mighty dread knights for battling greater demons. At the moment I'd say they're a fairly middle tier army, having got a decent boost from Psychic Awakening, but they were very weak and in a bad place before this. As with Death Watch, they're one of the slightly more minor marine factions, so don't enjoy as much support in terms of rules updates from Games Workshop, and their playstyle is pretty much prescribed. They're pretty much usually going to be an elite infantry based, with a fair amount of storm bolter shooting and a lot of power saws to employ in melee. Their options certainly got a lot more interesting with the different tides of the warp that you can employ in Psychic Awakening. It'll be interesting to see what people make with those. Next we have the Adeptus Custodes, the Emperor's own Space Marine Legion. 
If the Death Watch and the Grey Knights were the elite of the elite, then these guys are one step above them. Each one has the profile of a mini hero, employing incredibly powerful ranged and melee technology, and in the background they often act as bodyguards and advisors for Imperial generals across the Imperium. In terms of price, they're one of the cheapest armies you can collect, as each custody kit that you buy will generally cost a lot of points on the battlefield, allowing you to build up to a pretty sizable force without too much money invested, and without having to paint that many models. They're a fairly recent addition to the Imperial roster, being a new army entirely in recent years, therefore their unit roster is a little bit limited. You basically have guys on foot, fancy Terminators, and scary Hurricane Bolter jet bikes from the main codex. In my opinion, the sculpts are really quite well done. They look very ornate and striking on the tabletop. At the moment, as a standalone faction, they're probably middle to low tier, but they do get considerably better if you're willing to shell out four expensive Forge World tanks, as Forge World has produced quite a lot for them, and if you include Forge World models into the mix, then you over double the amount of units that they have to offer. I honestly don't suspect that they're going to be the faction that's going to see the most updates from Games Workshop, but it's heavily rumoured that they will be having a new codex coming out in the near future and typically a new codex means new models around, so watch this space for developments. Moving on, we have the forces of the Imperial Guard, or the Astra Militarum as they're known these days. This is the main Imperial human army, and there's certainly something iconic about just being a normal person, holding the line with nothing but cheap mass-produced war gear against the various horrors of the 41st millennium. They typically employ units that are reminiscent of World War I or World War II style units, and the various different regiments can really ape a lot of the different armed forces seen across the 21st century. If you're buying all the models from Games Workshop, then they are going to be one of the more expensive armies to collect, just because each squad is really quite cheap in points cost, and if you bought all of the plastic from Games Workshop themselves, you could be paying hundreds of pounds to just get enough inventory on the table to hold the line all right. Fortunately, as they're quite an old army in general without having had too many sculpts updated over the years, there's a lot of second-hand options for sale out there, and that's how I got the majority of my Imperial Guard force together. Their range of miniatures is absolutely enormous compared with some factions, but a lot of the sculpts are really quite old, particularly their standard line infantry, the Cadian Shock Troops and Kastjan Jungle Fighters which don't hold up quite as well compared with the more recent Games Workshop releases. At the moment, post their Psychic Awakening update, the Imperial Guards are pretty strong, though in particular they don't match up very well against Space Marines, who are stomping the meta at the moment. Games Workshop does support the Guard, they are one of the most popular factions, but they don't seem to release quite as many kits as you might expect for them, I suspect at least partly because they fear competition against rival miniature companies and would rather sell you something that's a bit more unique and harder for their rivals to ape. At the moment, their primary playstyle tends to be a large number of bodies to hold objectives, backed up by some fearsome tanks and artillery to lay down some firepower. Though other options are available, including the Militarum Tempestus drop forces, and you certainly can run lists that are mainly tanks or mainly infantry. It's worth noting that Forge World have absolutely tons of options for the guard should you want to go that way. In terms of faction rules choices, they're probably second only to the Space Marines. Next up, we have the recently released Adeptus Sororitas, or Sisters of Battle. These zealous warrior nuns of the Ecclesiarchy defend the faith of the Imperium, and particularly enjoy purging heretics with fire through melter and flamer weapons. They are a reasonably expensive army to collect, as their sculpts are all quite new, and therefore Games Workshop charges a little more for them, and their units aren't all that expensive to play on the board in terms of points. That being said, the fact that their entire army has been redone within the last few months means that the miniatures look absolutely stunning. I think Games Workshop have really knocked it out of the park in terms of the look and feel of these miniatures, and they're a pleasure to see on the tabletop. In terms of their rules, they're somewhat middle tier at the moment. They can have some success, but again, they don't particularly match up well against Space Marines, although frankly, not a lot does at the moment. Their rules probably aren't likely to be updated in the near future, as they just got an entire codex release, but it is a fairly well-written codex with a lot of different options, and they really do feel like a full-fleshed-out army. You are sort of skewed towards a mainly infantry playstyle when playing them, just because so many of their options tend to be infantry, and a lot of their buffs and synergies work that way. But they do have some transport options, and heavy fire support in the Exorcist. They work pretty well either as their own faction, or alongside other Imperial forces. Another reasonably recent army is the Adeptus Mechanicus, who weren't a faction at all until a few years ago. These guys are the machine-augmented warriors of the tech priests of Mars, and faithful servants of the Omnissiah. On the battlefield, they take to war with all manner of bizarre and eclectic technological contraptions, from many late dune crawlers, 
to hovercraft and soon to various bat-winged flyers and jump infantry. I'm certainly looking forward to the release of those miniatures. Their price is somewhat middling, perhaps more expensive than the majority of space marine armies, just as they have fairly recent sculpts and they don't tend to be quite as an elite of action, but there are certainly good discounts to be had, particularly their Stark collecting box is pretty handy for getting into the faction. It came out very well in my comparison of Stark collecting boxes I did the other week. I personally really like the aesthetic of these models, and I literally bought some of the rangers just to paint as a painting project, which I don't often do to be honest. Rules wise, they've been getting better and better throughout 8th edition from a very mediocre start. They can have some success in tournaments, and they should only increase when they get their Psychic Awakening update in Machine War, which is coming within the next couple of months. They have a lot of fun options to deploy on the tabletop, from powerful shooting to decent melee units, usually a mixed strategy being best. They also ally very well with other Imperial forces to cover some of their weaknesses, and can even chip in to help repair some of their allies' vehicles. Talking of allied vehicles, we have Imperial Knights, another reasonably recent addition to the faction lineup. These guys are somewhat unique in that they're a entire faction that is nothing but very big walkers, representing a household of nobles fighting in enormous armoured suits. You can have an Imperial Knight army for as little as four massive models on the table, and while they're somewhat expensive, the fact that you only really need a few of them makes them really quite cost and time efficient to get on the table if you want to jump into the game. Their kits are all very nice and really striking, but they do only really have three of them, Big Dominus Pattern Knights, the Ranged Castellan or the Close Range Valiant, the Questoris Pattern Kit, which makes most of the standard sized knights with melee and guns, and the small mini Armager class knights that serve as outriders and scouts for the faction. Rules wise, they've been very strong for the majority of 8th edition, but as with a lot in the meta, the Space Marines counter them quite well, and have kind of knocked them off the top spot. Most people tend to run knights as allies to other factions, particularly Imperial Guard or Admech, as just having a few extra troops to score objectives and give you some fun command points is really rewarding. Overall, they're quite a quick and punchy army to play, and have a unique playstyle where you really have to think about the placement of each model, although having just largely few big walkers does sometimes make the game a little one-dimensional. To wrap it up for the Imperium, we have Imperial Agents, this is Games Workshop's catch-all term for all of the things that don't really fit in the other factions, and functions as allies to the rest of them. You can get all manner of different Inquisitors, their rules were released in a White Dwarf article, so unfortunately it isn't necessarily the easiest to get hold of their official rules, but they do have some interesting options for augmenting your armies. There are the four Assassins, who can be included in your army to bring some specialised help to taking out certain enemy characters, and things like the Sisters of Silence, the anti psyker Force, that often works with the Adeptus Custodes, and things like the Rogue Traders which we saw a release of recently. The prices are somewhat variable, usually a little bit on the expensive side seeing as they're individual characters, but then again you're not really expecting to buy an entire army of them, just a few miniatures. Things like the Assassins and Sisters of Silence are really new and recent sculpts, whereas most of the Inquisitors are really quite old and still in either metal or resin. Rules wise, they can add some interesting twists to your forces. The majority of them aren't super super strong competitive wise, but there are certain niche uses that can be very helpful for them. Unfortunately, Games Workshop doesn't really have a very good history of supporting these guys properly. Both the Assassin and the Inquisitor rules, as I said, are scattered throughout White Dwarf articles which you might not be able to get. I'm hoping they might tie them together at some point in one of the Psychic Awakening books so you can have all the rules in one place. Overall though, they do add different playstyles to the game, and can be certainly interesting to put a different twist on your army. Now we're finally leaving the Imperium behind into the realms of Chaos. Chaos Space Marines are the primary Chaos faction, the fallen Astartes who betrayed the Emperor in the Horus Heresy, that is at the core of the 40k background, and they generally serve the four deities of Chaos, Korn, Slanesh, Nurgle and Zinch. The Chaos Marines aren't quite as cheap to get into as Space Marines, as they don't have quite as many easy build sculpts, and aren't part of the main starter sets at the moment, but again as they're relatively elite on the whole, they're not too bad. A lot of the Chaos range was very old until very recently, but Games Workshop gave them a big release where they redid the standard Chaos Marines and Terminators, and the old Chaos Obliterators as well. However, quite a large part of the range does remain very old, particularly some special characters, and a lot of the tanks. At the moment, the Chaos Marines are somewhat middle tier, at least unless you start allying in various other Chaos bits from the other factions. Games Workshop does support them more than the majority of factions, due to them being one of the main enemies of 40k but in general they won't see the same amount of attention as Space Marines do. 
They have a pretty large range, which supports multiple different playstyles, which has certainly been helped by their Psychic Awakening book, giving them different strats and options for the various different main Chaos Legions. You can run things like batteries of demon engines, big units of possessed warped space marines, taking advantage of psychic powers, or big squadrons of Forge World Dreadnoughts with powerful and scary guns. They tend to be overall a little bit more melee focused than your standard space marines, and get a lot more of their power through psychic powers and synergies compared with just raw damage output, so it might be a little bit trickier to play for a beginner. Moving on, Games Workshop have released two of the Space Marine Legions as their own standalone army, the most recent of which was the Death Guard. These are the dedicated Chaos Legion serving Nurgle, and their marines are characterised by being disease-ridden horrors, and often make war by spreading poison, death and decay. The Death Guard are very cheap to get into, as they both have lots of easy build kits available, and they're also available in these main starter kits, No No Fear and Dark Imperium, which can let you get a lot of points of Death Guard on the table for very cheap indeed. In addition to this, their entire range is very new, with highly detailed recent plastic sculpts, which is only an additional benefit. Rules-wise at the moment though, they are a bit of a lower tier army, and they just aren't as easy to win with as they used to be. Games Workshop hasn't given them a ton of support since the first initial big drop that they had at the start of 8th, but as they haven't had their Psychic Awakening book yet, we can expect some sort of update for them in the near future. In terms of playstyles, having a reasonably small range of miniatures somewhat limits their options, as they only have so many units to choose from. In general, in a Death Guard army, you can usually expect to see a fair few Plague Marines, maybe a Demon Prince or two, and likely some Demon Engines, either Bloat Drones or Plague Burst Crawlers, so a fairly mixed and durable force. Next up, we have the Thousand Sons, one of the other unique Space Marine Legions that's actually had a codex released for it. The Thousand Sons Legion is somewhat unique, as the only actual living, breathing Chaos Marines are their mutated sorcerers, as during the Horus Heresy, when they started to become... More and more mutated by the changing power of Zinch, a clever sorcerer called Ariman decided he needed to put a stop to this to preserve the integrity of the Legion, and turned all of the standard warriors of the Thousand Sons into dust, meaning that they now walk forward as clanking empty shells of armour under the imperious commands of the surviving sorcerers. All of their kits are pretty new and interesting. They also have some spillover from Age of Sigma, which allowed them to field Zangors as their Zinch cultists, and more recently the interesting Mutalith Vortex Beast. Overall, I think that the sculpts look really good though, and they're a reasonably cheap army to collect on the whole, seeing as a lot of their units cost quite a lot of points, so you don't need to invest quite as much to get a sizable army points-wise on the tabletop. At the moment, I'd say that Thousand Sons are generally a middle-tier army, that most reward people who know how to maximise their psychic potential, which is pretty decent, and can let them do some very silly and unexpected things on the table. Some of their core units went up in points in the new chapter approved, but they have got a bunch of new rules from Ritual of the Damned, so I guess we'll see how they perform going forward. Again, in terms of playstyles, their small range limits the amount of options that they have, and they often function best on the tabletop when allied with other things such as Chaos Demons, where you can just keep their main strength in their powerful psychic phase, and perhaps use a lot of other units for the actual main battle line. Talking of Chaos Demons, these are some of the truest faces of evil in Warhammer 40k, the horrific servants made manifest of the four main gods of Chaos. Spilling forth from the warp in enormous demon incursions, they present one of the greatest existential threats to all of the galaxy. In terms of cost to get into them, they're one of the slightly more expensive armies to run as a whole faction, mainly because you often want quite a lot of the smaller lesser demons, who are fairly expensive on a money per point basis. Their range again is a bit mixed, it's mostly plastic, but a lot of the sculpts are really quite old plastic models, particularly some of the core troops. That being said, they have seen some of their more recent kits updated, such as the Flesh Hounds and Fiends that came out in the Wrath and Rapture box recently. Rules-wise, they are struggling a bit at the moment, being fairly middle tier, particularly since things like Space Marine Eliminators came in to be able to easily eliminate characters, hiding behind screens of bodies, which was one of the main strategies of Chaos Demons. They do have an update outstanding in Psychic Awakening, however, so maybe that'll improve things for them. They do have multiple different styles of play, focused around the various different Chaos Gods, and you could have multiple detachments of demons doing entirely different things, such as very resilient demons of Nurgle, bloodthirsty demons of Korn, and Zinch demons casting spells and burning enemies with warp fire. So quite a lot of variation and interest within the one faction. Finally, and most recently for the Forces of Chaos, we have the Chaos Knights, or kind of Chaos Knight at the moment because there's only the one kit for the faction, although admittedly it is very nice looking. 
Besides this, you'll have to use the standard kits from the Imperial Knights faction and just paint them or convert them to look a little bit more chaosy. As with Imperial Knights, you can get a lot of points on the table in just a few models, so it's quite a good army if you want to get into the game quite quickly. Again, in terms of money invested for points, Knights aren't one of the worst factions. Chaos Knights are pretty powerful assets to deploy on the table alongside the other various forces of Chaos, and like the Imperial Knights, they very much work best when they're combined with other allies, particularly other big threatening things such as Demon Primarchs. Like with a lot of factions, they have a Psychic Awakening update in store for them in Engine War, I'll be very interested to see what the Imperial and Chaos Knights get out of that. Moving on to the forces of Xenos now, and we have the Craftworld Eldar, also known occasionally as the Azayani. These are a dying race of space elves, who live on giant spacefaring vessels called Craftworlds, and are using their strong grasp of psychic knowledge and advanced technology to remain a potent force in the galaxy. As it goes, they're probably one of the more expensive armies to collect, due to having quite a lot of resin miniatures in the range, and having a lot of units that are reasonably expensive, but not very high in points, as they've seen quite a lot of points drops recently. Their range is a bit mixed, a lot of the vehicles and jet bike mounted options have seen their models redone recently, as of these excellent Howling Banshees, but they still do have a lot of resin miniatures in the range among all of the aspect warriors and characters, which is a bit of a negative to collect in the faction. Rules-wise, the Eldar have generally been strong, although some recent points hikes and chapter approved on their much-feared Air Force, combined with the advent of Space Marines, has definitely seen them take a step back in the meta. Despite that, they certainly have many strong options, and certainly outcompete a lot of other factions. The Eldar have generally been fairly well-supported rules-wise from Games Workshop, at least out of the Xenos factions, and have historically had some of the strongest rules for quite a while. With a reasonably large range, they have a fair few different playstyles that you can try with them, from that feared Air Force, to tank and vehicle heavy Eldar, to some more nuanced strategies including their infantry and various jet bikes. Moving on over to the Eldar's Dark Mirror, the Drukhari, or the Dark Eldar. These guys are the Fallen Eldar, who long ago gave themselves over to hedonism and sustained themselves through the infliction of pain and the harvesting of souls from other races in the galaxy. They launched lightning raids from their webway city of Komara, often attacking for no other reason than to capture slaves and inflict pain. Like the Eldar, they are a relatively expensive faction to collect, this time mainly because a lot of their units tend to be very fragile, meaning that they'll have a relatively low points cost and you'll need quite a lot of them to get an army together. Dark Eldar had a big range refresh in relatively recent history, and in my opinion their sculpts hold up really well. They're a very dynamic little army on the tabletop, without too many fine cast models about. On the whole, I'd say the Dark Eldar aren't quite as strong or well supported as their Craft World brothers, though I've had some times when they've been very, very strong in 8th edition already, so who knows, they may come to rise again. They do most certainly have various different viable player styles, though. The biggest difference between the three major sects of the Dark Eldar the Cabals with their Raiders and Venoms and Splinter weapons, the Witch Cults with their Gladiatorial Arena combat training, and the Hemunculi Covens with their assortment of Biomonstrosities. You really can have Dark Eldar forces that operate in very different ways. Now onto the Harlequins, or Clown Eldar. These enigmatic performers are the Guardians of the Black Library, operating through the Webway and working with the Drukhari or the Craftworld Eldar in many important battlefronts and theatres of war. Their fighting style is as much a performance as it is a tactical battlefield art, typically moving fast and confounding their foes with various stealth and confusion based technology. Now Harlequins tend to be a faction that isn't played as their own unique army, typically more often in allies to either Craft Worlds or Drukhari, though it is just about possible to make a full list of them. They're a reasonably expensive faction, again like Dark Eldar, having fancy units that aren't very durable so they don't cost that many points. Unfortunately, they're not really a very well-supported faction, either in terms of rules or models, and they aren't really the strongest on the tabletop at the moment, although, like several others, they are due a Psychic Awakening update at some point in the future, which could give them a new lease of life. Their primary playstyle is a hit-and-run jetbike-based army, and they have to use their fast speed and manoeuvrability to outwit their opponent, because they generally won't win in a straight-up fight. They're certainly a bit more of a challenge to play at the moment, so it might not be the best first choice if you're just starting in the game. To round out our look at Space Elves, we have the Yanari. These are a kind of pseudo-faction of Eldar that's dedicated to worshipping Inez, the god of the dead, whose power grows with the more Eldar that die. They can draw units from Craftworld's Harlequins and Drukhari, with some notable exceptions that they're excluded from using. And in terms of their own unique models, they only have the three characters pictured here, at least at the moment. 
The characters are very cool looking and they're very nice sculpts, so they're quite flexible if you wanted to mix and match some units from different Eldar factions. While having horrendously broken game mechanics for the vast majority of 7th and 8th edition, the Inari were very harshly brought into line with their White Dwarf update, which changed them from having multiple activations of movement and shooting, which was hilariously powerful, to being a mainly melee based Eldar army, where unfortunately Eldar do tend to struggle a bit barring certain units. In general, they're a fairly low tier army competitive wise at the moment, and you're better off with the other Eldar factions on the whole, though a skilled player can certainly make them work. They haven't seen a lot of support recently since their inception, but in all honesty I'd be very surprised if Games Workshop isn't going to fully flesh them out as their own faction at least at some point down the line. I guess we'll have to wait and see. Next up we have the Tau, a young, optimistic and technologically industrious race who are rapidly expanding and eating into the Imperium's territory. They have caste-based systems with the Firecast being their main warrior class and overall are lorded over by their ethereals. They strive towards a greater good, theoretically to try and make the galaxy a better place for all, but mysteriously seems to fall in line with their empire expanding. Their signature unit is the Battle Suit, which are typically huge anime style affairs, so if you're into manga, you might like these guys. They're probably fairly similar to Space Marines in terms of price for collecting them. A fair few of their models are quite big and points intensive, so you can get together a reasonable force for not so much of a financial investment. And their start collecting box, which is pictured here, is a particularly good one value-wise. It came out well in the comparison of start collecting boxes that I did recently. The vast majority of their sculpts are quite recent as well, which is also nice. In particular, their new updated Fire Warriors really bring together the range a bit although a few relics do exist, like their alien mercenaries, which haven't seen an update since they came out. In general, Tower are a upper mid-tier faction, and certainly have some very scary strong builds, such as having a bunch of riptides or broadsides covered in shield drones to make them near invulnerable. They also receive some greater good special rules, and a nice upgraded Shadow Sun model, so we may well be seeing a bit of a Tower revival in the competitive scene, particularly if Space Marines get nerfed. They enjoy a reasonable amount of support from Games Workshop as one of the more popular Xenos factions, and they do have a fair few different things that you can do with the army, though basically all of them tend to revolve around killing your opponent at range, whether that's from a long way away with riptides or broadsides, or from close range with deep striking battle suits or massed ranks of fire warriors. Next we have the Tyranids, who are very much the archetype of a all-consuming alien death spawn that moves from planet to planet, stripping the world's bare. These insectoid aliens have no real diplomacy, and just plough straight through planets as an unstoppable force of nature, and they can only ever be stopped with an overwhelming force. They're another army that's sort of middling in terms of their price, which very much depends on the units that you want to buy. They tend to be about average in terms of cost for Warhammer 40k. Their sculpts are also a bit of a mixed bag. They do have a fair few newer bogs, particularly the bigger armoured ones, but a lot of their core troops are quite old and beginning to show their age. Rules-wise, I'm afraid they have been struggling quite a bit in 8th edition, and never really recovered after their flying hive tyrant Scott, heavily nerfed in a spring balance update. They haven't seen an absolute ton of rule support, generally not massively better or worse than any other Xenos faction. They do have multiple playstyles, you can either play massive bugs, and a bit of a Nidzilla sort of army, a huge swarm of gaunts, they have various ranged options between Hive Guards and Exocrines, and they can sling Gene Stealers around with the Swarm Laws. However though, all of these builds are somewhat hampered by their reasonably weak rules, and in my opinion are one of the factions that could most use a bit of a buff in terms of points. Along with the Eldar, the Tyranids are the only Xenos faction that has some overt allies, and these are the Gene Stealer Cults. These hybrid mutant humans have been infested by specialist broodlords called Patriarchs, and lurk in the bowels of Hive Cities, plotting the day when they will be overthrowing their Imperial oppressors. They worship the Tyranids as their star gods, and work hard to prep the planet for their arrival. In terms of a faction to get into in 40k, I'd probably argue that Gene Sealer Cult are the most expensive. They have multiple new recent plastic kits, which look very nice, but they do come with a price tag, and these guys tend to operate as a bit of a horde with large units of infantry popping up from deep strike to attack the enemy. If you need a large number of models, and the models are all quite expensive, then it's going to cost quite a lot, and even their vehicle units are pretty expensive and also pretty cheap to field in the game, which doesn't help, so bear in mind that collecting Gene Silicolts might be a bit of a costly endeavour, even if they are a very cool army to see fielded on the table. Rules wise, they were very strong until quite recently, where in chapter approved some of their core units got some points hikes, and also, with Space Marines having access to an easy counter to their Deep Strike shenanigans in Orspec Scan, 
They've been certainly struggling to break through in recent months. As a slightly more minor Xenos faction, they're not likely to see quite as much rule support as some of the others, and they've just had their Psychic Awakening update, which unfortunately was a little bit underwhelming. In terms of their playstyle, they're largely orientated around their units popping up out of reserve and surprising the enemy with ambushes, although you can try and make some other things work, such as running and gunning with Neophytes and Ridge Runners. One of the most interesting things about the Gene Stealer Colts is their ability to ally with both the Tyranids and the forces of the Imperial Guard, creating some very interesting ally options, and this is certainly a fun way to run them. Next up we have the Orcs, the unruly greenskin menace that charges forth into the fray with arms and vehicles cobbled together from whatever scrap they can find lying around. They fight purely for the joy of battle and to stomp enemies flat, and are typically seen fielded in huge numbers, with hundreds of boys or lots of war machines. As with a lot of armies, this numerical superiority means that you'll have to pay a little bit more for the miniatures, though as a lot of the orc range is fairly well established and hasn't been updated in a long while, it means that you can find a lot of second-hand miniatures online for them typically. Quite a lot of their models haven't been updated in a long while, and they do still have some fine cast lurking around some of their elite choices, but they have had a unique update recently with a bunch of their new boggies for playing a speed freak orc list, so certainly that style of play has got a lot more interesting, and they really look good on the table. Games Workshop have revealed that they have redone Gaskell Thracker as well, the biggest baddest orc of the lot, so we've certainly got him to look forward to when we see Saga of the Beast. At the moment I'd say orcs are fairly middle tier, but they do have some very powerful builds, and having such a big, flexible horde of very strong melee orcs can really do a number on a lot of competitive army lists, particularly when played by a skilled player. I'm certainly looking forward to seeing what Saga of the Beast can do for them. Should be interesting, and they can be quite a varied army, both having the Green Tide style option, powerful shooting options from looters and mech guns, and you can also do things like speed freaks or dread mobs, deploying a lot of their war machines if you feel like it, so they do have different options for ways to play them. Now we come to Necrons, the skeletal forces of an ancient machine empire, reawakening from their tomb worlds to reclaim their past glory and purge the lesser races from a galaxy that they see as rightfully theirs. Again, they're a reasonably elite army, which means they aren't quite as expensive to field as some. They've had a lot of their range redone relatively recently, and most of the plastic kits look quite good, but some notable exceptions still exist from before the main example being their warriors. Necrons have been on the up and up for the last few months, with some decent placing at tournaments, the chapter approved points drops have certainly helped them, and they can be a decent force in the hands of a skilled player. Again, they're due for a Psychic Awakening update in the near future, so we can see what that does for them. In general, they're mainly a mid-range shooting army, though they do have some other interesting options with flyers, lots of wraiths, and some of their vehicles, but the rules for some of these units do hamper them somewhat. So, have we missed anyone? Let's take a look. No, they're not a thing. No, they're not a faction anymore. Yep, I think that's all of the factions done. I hope you found this review useful. I know it's gone on quite a while, but I wanted to do each faction justice and try and give a proper overview to a new incoming player. If you've got any insights as to advice for collecting your own faction and things that you wish you knew when you started, please post them down below to stop others making some of the same mistakes. And if you've enjoyed this video, feel free to subscribe to Auspex Tactics, where we have regular 40k content coming out every single day. If you'd like to support the channel, I have a Patreon page where the link is in the description below. These videos take a long time to make, so anything you'd like to give as a thank you is much appreciated, as I am trying to do this as a bit more of a full-time thing, rather than just a hobby in weekends and evenings. Joining the Patreon gets you some benefits, such as seeing videos early, my own tournament lists and reports when they happen, and voting on polls for what's going to happen with the future of the channel. So if any of that interests you, or if you'd just like to say thank you and support new videos, then the link is down below. Thanks very much for listening, I'll hope to see you guys next time.